some of you guys might recognize this. This is what we did two videos ago. Um, this was allowed us to read from our EEPROM by setting an address here. This, that was wrong. Some of you might recognize this. It looks a little bit different now, as does the other one. This is what we did in the last uh, video in the CPU series. And this led us right to our EEPROM via an Arduino and a computer using this USB port. This was also wrong. So basically, we've done everything wrong. And I know how to fix it. And in fact, that's why those chips, those pieces look different, because I have fixed it. So let's go over the changes that I did to fix it. So let's just start chronologically the last video, or two videos ago, rather. OK, what was wrong with this? We forgot our pull down resistors. So what I've done here is I've added pull down resistors to all these pins so that this way we're getting true zeros and we're not floating any of these address pins when we try and read something so that when we're actually reading something we're reading the right address and it's not changing all over the place. Okay, so this fixed. So just remember you guys do that. How was this wrong? All right, well this was probably the stupidest thing I've ever done. Um, we had a couple of errors in fact and let me point them out to you. Okay, first things first, what I added here was a blue LED. And you'll see when I show you the change that I made in the code. Because don't think that the code was perfect either. The code was uh, another screw up that we did in the last video. But um, in the code, I added this LED to pin 19. And I said basically, when you're done running the code, when you're done run, you know, writing to the EEPROM, then turn this LED on. This way, I just know it's safe to go ahead and pull out the EEPROM now. And I'm not just guessing. OK, so that's OK. And it goes to ground through a 1K resistor here. So there's no problems. All right, now here's where the actual mess up begins. Let's pull out the data sheet for our chip. All right, data sheet, our favorite character. Um, apparently, we didn't look at this at all. I thought we looked at it plain enough, but I wasn't paying attention, I guess, because I totally forgot that write enable and output enable are on pins 21 and 20. For some reason, I thought they were on pins 20 and 19. And so when we managed to write to the EEPROM in the last video, we just got lucky, in fact. And we got lucky with setting the write. Um, and that these pins just happened to float down and up at the right times. And we managed to write to the EEPROM, just pure luck. Because when I try to write anything else or at any other time, it doesn't work. And that's why. Well, one of the reasons why, OK? We'll get to the other reasons soon. Um, so first of all, this chip enable, this, um, what is this line? Yeah, output enable. Okay, so the yellow wire is output enable. This blue line is write enable. Now, you may remember that this the this one's the same, right? I just shifted over one spot, but this is going all over the place. And that is the third thing that we need to talk about. So before I had it coming straight from here, and you may remember that the um, AC write characteristic, so we'll just take a look at it. AC write characteristics say 100 to 1,000 nanosecond uh, pulse, uh, you know, downward pulse to, or that's equal, also equal to one microsecond to write to the EEPROM. And we said, oh yeah, that's great. Um, you know, our Fuberino slash Arduino can handle that because we can do a one microsecond pulse. Now we can, but that's the upper limit. And for some reason, it doesn't really work. And in fact, it doesn't work. I don't know why I would think that going straight to the upper bar limit would somehow sit you in the middle that you could do it all the time. So we're going to fix that with this circuit, which I have here that goes out to the side. So the Fuberino chip, which is the right enable pin right here, the one that's supposed to be pulsing, comes out to the side to this capacitor and resistor that are in series together that will come into this. So how does this circuit work? Great question. OK, the circuit that we have there is, let's just start with what's actually the most important part, which is the capacitor, right? So we have our capacitor, and then we have a resistor which goes to our 5 volts, okay? And R, this is a you know resistance of R and a capacitance of C, right? And we also have a pull up resistor here on this side, and we'll talk about why we need that when I explain what this circuit does, right? And you know this is just a this is a much higher resistance value because it's just a it's just a pull up resistor. Now then this goes to our Fuberino, right? Which is obviously going to act and control it as a switch. Now this switch goes low because remember we're pulsing low, so this switch goes low like this. Okay, so this is essentially what we have. Now the Fuberino is controlling the switch. Just just remember that. 
and then the output is going to be here. Okay, output. So what's going to happen is, what's normally going to happen is, you know, if it's connected both to 5 volts, then charges are going to fall, a positive charge is going to come here, and positive charge is also going to come onto this plate. So right now, we're going to have positive charges on both sides of the plate. Okay. When we connect this, not only is the current from the positive charges that are here on this plate going to go down, but for those of you who know how a capacitor works, the positive charges on this plate are also going to flow this way, and sink down to ground. So then current is going to flow through this capacitor just for a little bit, just like how it normally does in capacitor. Now, if you have a large capacitance here, then a lot of current is going to flow. And if you have a small capacitance, then only a little bit of current is going to flow. Okay, And of course, it has to do with the size of your resistor too, because then it depends on the size of the resistors, how, um, how much charges you can build up and how quickly you can build up the charges there. But if you have a high resistance, then you're going to take a long time to build up charges on this plate again. And it's just going to you know, it's going to sink out. So it's going to take a long time for this curve to come back up to um, to 5 volts again. If So if you look at this output, what's going to happen is you're going to have it coming along. Then we hit the switch, and it's going to drop straight down, right? Because all the current is just going to sink straight to ground. And then charges are going to build itself back up again, and you're sort of going to get this curve that looks like that, okay? Now, the size right here, Okay, the size right here is dependent on R times C, which makes sense because if you have a if you have a large capacitance, then you're going to need more time to build it up. If you have a large um, resistance, you're also going to need more time because it's going to be harder for charges to flow back onto the plate. So that you know this makes sense. R times C. Now, what we want ideally is to for the control line of or our right enable line of our EEPROM is it's supposed to look something like that. Now, this is a really ideal situation, okay? In fact, it's uh, it's less ideal than, you know, just trying to booking it at 1,000 nanoseconds and hoping that we actually get the right enable going correctly, right? This is, you know, putting a curve like this, which is a proper amount of nanoseconds, is a much safer bet than um, putting a curve that looks like this for 1,000 nanoseconds, if you, if you understand what I'm saying. So what I decided to do is go for the high probability one, which is this, and that's going to work more often. So this depends on your resistance and capacitance value. So what I picked for my my resistor, okay, so I picked a 470 ohm resistor, and I picked a capacitance of, I think, 0 0.1 um, uh, microfarad, which is also the same thing as... Um, I believe that is, that should be one, 100 nanofarad, right? And so if you multiply this out, then what you're going to end up getting is that we get a right pulse width. This pulse width right here is going to be equal to 470 nanoseconds. Now, if you remember correctly, we're trying to keep it in between 100 and 1,000 nanoseconds. And we're hit sitting at 400, 470, which is not bad at all. 470 is not bad at all. That's pretty much like in the middle there. It's a perfect, a near perfect uh, right pulse width. The only problem is that you have this curving part. But, you know, if you pick any point along this curve, right, the probability is um, that it's going to be below the threshold, which is the important part, right? Now here, the probability is 100% that's going to be below the threshold. Here, the probability is just high that if you pick any point, it's going to be below the threshold that says that it's a zero. So that's just sort of how this system works. Okay, so that's what I replaced it with with our right pulse width, just to make sure that we're getting consistent writes. Now, one thing that I did is I changed the set data. Remember, we changed this. We created the start pin. And last time it was 12. Well, that's incorrect. We changed it to 11 because if you think about it here, if you go up to this code, now this is also for what we're going to learn about later. But if you go up to this code, let's just take our first instance of i equals 0. So then you're going to 7 plus the start pin, which was 12 previously, which is 19. Now, 19, if you actually look on our, this thing here, I'll show you here. Okay, 19, 19, pin 19 here is actually the pin for our LED. And in fact, pin 19 is not hooked up to any of these wires that actually end up going to the EEPROM at all. So that means that everything we were doing was shifted over just one bit because one of the bits we were writing actually wasn't even hooked up to the EEPROM at all. 
So you can see here that I changed it, in fact, to number 11, because if you think about it, 7 um, at instant 0, so 7 plus the start pin, which is number 11, will give you 18. Now, 18 is actually the first line, or rather the last line that's connected to our EEPROM. So um, that actually makes sense. So, we're, so now we're officially um, shifted the bits back over so that we're writing correctly now, which is which is good. So that's the error that we fixed here. Now let's talk about, so I think we have made up in this video for the errors that we made previously. So now it is time, I think, to move ahead um, in what I actually wanted to accomplish with this video, which was actually writing to a seven segment display and actually getting a seven segment display to light up with the correct number. So we're gonna do that today. The number to convert and then on this side is going to be seven segment display. Okay. So what I'm just doing is writing the A to G bits that we need to for our seven segment display to work properly. Let's just do the number zero. Now to write the number zero on the seven segment display, we have to do our A to G values. So we're gonna do, all right, so let's do A and then G is going to be on this side. So we're going to do 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, and 0. Okay, so we didn't go all the way over there. But essentially, you get the idea. Uh, six ones and one zero. This just means because this last bit, the G, is actually the middle bar. So we're, just, so we're actually going to get is a display light up that looks like that. Okay, now number 1 is going to be 0, 1, 1, zero and just the rest zeros after that and that of course i think we all know how number one is going to light up and that's just going to sort of look like this so i'm just going to go ahead through and do the rest of these for us nine okay so this is how we're going to do oh we just sort of slant it this way but you guys can see clearly here how we're going to do this right now here's the thing we have a common anode right so we have actually the seven segment display that I have, which I'll show you. This one is actually a common anode display. So that means that in fact, um, what, instead of being ones to light up the LEDs, we actually need zeros to light up the LEDs. So we actually need to invert all of these bits. So what I did here is I wrote the numbers and the integer forms of these binary values on the side here because what I want to do for this in the program is just store the integer forms and then have the Arduino ID convert the integer forms to binary and then output the binary. This way I don't have to store the binary value and deal with all that nonsense. I'm just going to have Arduino do it for me and store the integer value. So I've converted these binary numbers to integers and this is what we're going to deal with right now. All right, so we can program our EEPROM with the information to run our seven segments displayed and that's all good, but um, we actually need the seven segment display in the first place if we want to actually see if it's working. So um, what I'm going to do is go ahead and we'll build that right now. Now, the seven segment displays that we have are common cathode seven segment displays, which is worth noting um, because and I'm going to put this right on the edge. Okay. Now, the next thing is we can go ahead and get our EEPROM. So from here, I can just go ahead and take this out, and we'll connect it up here. We can see here um, that we need a few pins. Well, write enable, we're never going to be writing to this chip, so that will be grounded always. Um, you know, because once it's in this configuration, this is the already programmed configuration. It's all done. So we're just going to be reading from it just from this point. So write enable should be high, so we're not writing to it. And output enable, well, it's always going to be outputting. It's never going to be taking input on those pins. So output enable, we will also um, we'll put that low. And then chip enable, well, we're always going to have chip enable on. So we're just always going to keep that low like we've been doing. All right, so we have these now. Um, and I also connected the com of this chip up to um, power this way this chip's always powered obviously and so we have chip enable tied low output enable tied low always outputting and then we have write enable tied high because we never want to write to this chip while it's here so then the next step is to talk about our pin configurations and we can go ahead and do that now 
Okay, so right here where we wrote A to G, this is the same thing A to G right here. So G will actually be connected to IO0. So um, so this is actually IO0 uh, up to IO6. So A is IO6, so A is IO6 and G is IO0. So that's just how we're going to connect it up here. Now we can get the IO pins here off of our data sheet. Right. Now, of course, if you want to do it a different way, you could do G to A if you want to, if you just, you know, just mirror all of these bits across. But this is just the way that I'm going to do it, A to G like this. So I'm going to get started. And the way we're going to do the wiring, I should probably talk about this. So for the wiring, it's not going to be usual. So I'm not going to go here and put the wires, you know, and cross them like this or like this. I'm actually going to go all the way around if it needs to come up to the top. And the reason for that is, if you guys remember, is we actually need to have three seven segment displays, which means that I actually don't have space, right? So let's just talk about two. If I, I can't, if these need to be back to back, right? Like these are going to be back to back. So I won't have any space to, I won't have any space to run the wire across. So I have to go all the way around and we'll run it like this. Okay. Now for now, we're only, in this video, we're only talking about one seven segment display. But it's important to just know that that's why we're doing this. All right, so now it's finished. So we can go ahead and load up some data on the EEPROM, put it in here, and it should display out on the seven segment display. So here we are on the computer now. And so the first thing that we want to do is I made this int A to G bits. Now this is for the positive values, for the non-inverted. So what I'm going to redo is I'm going to put these values away. Right. I'm going to put in the inverted one. So the first one is 1, then 79. So now if we say go in this array and get element 0, which means convert 0, then that will return a 1. So then that returns a 1, which is when we output on the EEPROM, we'll put a 1 on, which will put a 0 on the 7 segment display because of the inversion. Back here on the computer, we can see digital write, let's write the number 5 at address 0, and at the same time, after that, we'll also write data a to g, a to g bits, the number 5 at 5. So we'll test both. Now, as we programmed in, at zero, address zero, we have a five that shows up on our screen. And if we go to address five, by changing these, we also have a five. So we can see that this is actually working. We're able to program our EEPROM. So now the next step for us is to program in the digits, uh, the numbers zero through nine on addresses zero through nine. And then we'll be done. And then I'm also going to change this out for a resistor. This way this LED is not blinding you guys. All right, so on the computer now, we just want to program in the digits 0 to 9. So we'll just go ahead and do it like this. Um, int i is equal to 0. We'll start at the 0 instance, obviously, because we need to program in 0. Then i is less than 10. We need to go up to 9. i++. plus plus. And so then here, all we'll write in this code is the um, write data. And the integer for our data will be a to g bits which will of i which will return the um the correct integer so that we can program in a number at i and the address will obviously be i so this should work and then at the end we want to turn this on to say that we're done writing and so this should technically work assuming that assuming that we got all of these numbers correctly and we converted these properly then this should work for digits 0 through 9 so what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to go ahead and upload it. All right. So here we go. Here is the grand finale. At 0, we have a 0. At 1, we have a 1. At 2, we have a 2. At 3, 3. At 4, 4. At 5, 5. At 6, 6. At 7, oh, sorry, 7, 7. And at 8, 8, and at 9, 9. So we have successfully programmed the digits 0 through 9 into our EEPROM, and we can output them on a 7-segment display. So the next step will be using these three address lines 
to say which digit that we're programming in. Or sorry, um, these last two. This, this first one is for the signed and unsigned, and then these last two will be the next one.